Hey, he's not here. <laughs> You're, he's here. That's <laughs> right. He's fine. I bet he's listening to Okay, I'm going to start with a song. And the song is called The New Beginning. This morning I felt like this is New the beginning. perfect song today. <laughs>
So I wanted to uh, a couple of you kind of delivered a package of very helpful information for your mind, but I wanted to complete the package today. So you go with the, the complete package on your way. About 20 years ago it was the end of the millennium, and there was a string of movies that came out called The Matrix, Dark City. Uh, 13th floor, these were heralding the awakening because all of these movies were referring to this world as a, as a simulation. As the Matrix was a computer generated simulation made to keep you blind, made to keep you from knowing who you are. The 13th floor actually uh, allowed travel back in time to other to another era, I think it was around the 30s, and yet the characters could go back and forth between modern day and old, and then finally they started wondering what's real. Like if if I'm just a character that can travel back in, in time, then what what is real? Uh, what is beyond? It actually had a scene where it, it looked like the Matrix, where they went out to a desert, Southwest United States, and and all I saw were these green like lines like in the matrix when they came to the they call it the end of the world and so for many 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 centuries this world has been seen as a real thing and something you have to try to survive in and deal with but that's so tiny of a perspective and it's so inaccurate that it's no wonder there's been world wars there's been we talked about racial strife, civil wars, there's diseases, plagues. It's just been conflict after conflict after conflict because there seems to be no solution, no peaceful solution in this simulation, in this dream world. And, and that's because it was set up to be unsolvable. The world is an unsolvable puzzle. And it was meant to keep you so distracted trying to solve it, that you wouldn't be still, that you wouldn't be still and go inside and realize that none of it was real and who you are is real and the world isn't. And there's a part in the Course in Miracles where Jesus comes right out and he says, and to the ego this sounds like the most arrogant line in ever, but Jesus says in the Course in Miracles workbook, you are the goal the world is searching for. You are the goal the world is searching for. The ego, oh, because it just sees the you as the personality self. And it's like, that's hogwash, that's ridiculous, what a bunch of BS, what a bunch of bunk. That's the most arrogant statement, but he's not talking about the personality self you, he's not talking about the ego you, he's talking about who you are. And remember the ancient Greeks, way back, even before the time of Jesus, their main teaching was know thyself. Their, their entire teaching of the ancient Greeks was know thyself. The Greeks were, you might remember, the ones right next to the Romans, who, while the Romans were out conquering the world, the Greeks were in swimming pools all day long. They lived in hot pools. Imagine living your entire life in a hot tub and pondering, what is the nature of things? What is this all about? You know, there's a contrast between those two countries. The ancient Greeks were trying to discover what is the point of everything? What is the purpose of everything? And the Romans were out 
Uh, the purpose is to take over the world, you know. And that's where we have the Roman Empire, quite vast, uh, all over the world. And yet, to me, I've had people tell me after they hear my talks, they said if the politicians would just get out of the capitals and out of the, all these legislative meetings and arguing and fighting and pointing the finger, and if they would just all go into a big warm swimming pool together in their bathing suits, they probably could resolve things a lot quicker than with gavels pounding and, and taking votes. You know, they, they're they reacting to the world as if the world's real, and, and it's an unsolvable question. So that's why the legislatures are so crazy, is because they're looking outside for solutions. And they actually believe it's their responsibility as elected officials to solve problems for humanity. It's kind of noble. They're trying to do something noble, but they have no clue what it's about. So the final picture today that I'm going to give you is, is um, a lot of the scientists, some of you might have heard of Elon Musk, and a lot of the real progressive scscientists that are Elon Musk and SpaceX and going to explore other planets now, and Tesla cars and all kinds of things. Elon Musk and a, a large percentage, I'd say a large majority of scientists today, when they gather among themselves and they start to have their discussions like the ancient Greeks, like what do you think is going on? That there's a large, there's actually a majority of scientists that are really progressive that believe that this world is a simulation. They have, they have now, the scientists have come to a point that it's a simulation. What caused the simulation? They have no idea. Who's running the simulation? They have no idea. They are speculating that there is a future race more advanced than Earthlings that are running this simulation. That's as far as they've gotten. But that's pretty far. Just for scientists to get to the point that this is a simulation, a game, like a, a, an advanced computer game, and everybody's being moved around in some kind of orchestrated way by something, but they don't know, have any idea what that something is or what started the simulation, but they believe it has to be an advanced race and that the human race is being used for entertainment for this advanced race. They, when they get bored of this advanced race, they get involved with the human race because there's so much drama and it provides so much excitement that this is their movie theaters. We go to movie theaters to be entertained. The advanced race, the scientists say, are having fun with the human race as running this simulation. Now, what I will tell you is it's not a future race that's running this simulation. It's the ego made this simulation because even in this world the scientists have speculated for years where did the earth come from, where did the solar system, where did the galaxies, and they pretty much agreed there must have been some kind of big explosion and they call it the Big Bang. And so they believe that the beginning of this cosmos, or this what we're calling simulation now, began with a big explosion of hot gases. But that's still looking for the beginning, the origin of the cosmos in the cosmos, you see? And what's missing in that view of science is no one is talking about the mind, the consciousness, or the unconscious mind. So Jesus, what he does is he gives us, in the Course in Miracles, he gives us the whole picture he said, when you believed that you could separate from your source, which is actually impossible, it's just a belief. It's a, he calls it a tiny mad idea. Actually, it's a laughable idea that you could actually be separate from your source. But from this tiny mad idea, given to a very powerful mind called the Christ mind, you give, it, it's almost like if you had a room, a carpeted room, and you had a a little box and a button, and if, if that button is put, pushed, it sets off a hundred nuclear explosions all over the world, if that one button is pushed. And it's on a carpet, and it's there, and it's in a room, but it's over in the corner. And you put a baby 
a crawling baby in that room. And that baby crawls around the room and then looks over and sees something in the corner and is curious and goes over and, and steps on, pushes down that button and boom, the whole world blows up because a baby wanders over and touches that button. That's kind of like a tiny man idea that's not, not really worth anything but laughing at is actually believed in as if it's real. If you, if you actually give the powerful mind that you are and believe in the most incredible, unbelievable belief, a, a, a belief that's unimaginable, but if you give your mind to it, then it sets up what seems to be an artificial world, a, a simulated world, which has no reality whatsoever, but it's coming from a very powerful mind that's been given over to a very crazy idea. Now here's the fascinating part. Jesus says that the dream that you're experiencing from that tiny man idea has two parts. Now, I hadn't talked about those two parts yet, so that's, that's going to be the missing piece of the puzzle for you today. Jesus says that this dream that you're dreaming has two parts, and the first part is the dream that you dream in secret, and the second part is the dream that you gave away. The dream that you dream in secret is the unconscious mind. And it's dark. It's black. It is wickedly dark. In fact, Jesus uses a phrase to describe this dream that you dream in secret. Why in secret? Why is it so hidden? Why is it pushed out of awareness? Why is it way out of awareness? It's because Jesus says this dream. Remember, it's not real, but if you believe in the ego, it sure seems it. the dream that you dream in secret, he said, is draped with sin. Draped with sin. And, and it's just another way of saying it's very dark. That's why it's secret, because you couldn't bear to keep it in your mind, in awareness. So you made a portion of your mind where it would just be sealed away, covered over. And it's almost like sometimes Christians talk about making a bargain with the devil, like Listen, this is bad, and I never, ever, never want to see this again, and I want to get lost in something else, so I never have to face this, because I don't want to face this part of my mind ever again. And it's so, it's almost like a cornerstone is put over the top of that, and then a projected world, which is what Jesus calls the dream that you gave away. Why does he say the dream that you gave away? Because the external world the human being seems to be external. It seems that things happen to us. Hurricanes happen to us. Typhoons, diseases, we're taught, happen to us from germs and bacteria and things. Wars happen to us. Strife, conflict. Uh, you know, you're in a love relationship with somebody, we'll say for 10 years, and you're so in love, and then one morning they get up and they give you this strange look, and they go, I'm leaving. And you, you, your, your heart just drops down. <laughs> and like, you're what? <laughs> but we're so in love, you know. Think of all the love songs that are written when somebody just says goodbye unexpectedly. You feel like you've got, you found love, and you, you're so happy, and you're so grateful. And then I'm leaving, and it hits you, blindsides you. And people go into depressions, anxiety, sometimes they lose their mind, sometimes they're suicidal, because there's a sense of rejection and abandonment that is so deep, and that's coming from just a reflection of this unconscious mind, this dream that you dream in secret. That's a little tiny taste of how terrible that unconscious mind feels. And so the dream that you gave away is it seems to be external to you, and that's why there's a very strong victim mentality in this world, because we believe there's something outside of us, whether it's the government, whether it's other people or a certain group of people, whether it's tyrants. You can even say, well, there's Hitler and Osama bin Laden and Mussolini, and you know, you can go through Saddam Hussein and all these tyrants, Donald, uh, 
You know, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> tyrants. Accepted tyrants, not accepted tyrants. Tyrants, Gandhi said, oh, tyrants, they will come and they will go. But the truth remains. But even the projection of the tyrants, guess what? Is a projection of this dream that you dream in secret. There really are no evil people out there. They just get pinned with the vicious and it's like, ooh, we need to eliminate, get rid of this one and that one. We need to make the world a better place by eliminating. No, no, that's still eliminating. That's, that's vicious. Anytime you talk about healing something by eliminating somebody, you know, that's like mafia, that's like godfather stuff. It's like, that's, it's not pretty stuff. And so, what does that have to do with us? Well, I'm telling you all this because it's important to allow yourself, it's important to give your mind permission to let some of that unconscious darkness up. Because you don't heal it by keeping it sealed. You don't heal by seal. You don't seal it away in the basement and just say, I am never going down to that basement again. I'm just going to bolt the doors. In fact, I'm going to bolt the doors, I'm going to lock it up, and I'm just going to drywall right over that door <laughs> in architecture. Let's just eliminate the basement altogether. It's still there, but let's just... It's got cobwebs, it's dark, it's moist, there's spiders growing down there. Arachnophobia, that's a projection too on the spiders of unconscious guilt. You know, spiders, snakes, snake gets snake a bad rap, you know. In the Bible, there's a snake that came along. That's projecting the unconscious guilt onto the snake, onto the apple. I've had Christians tell me that, damn apple. <laughs> Eve was doing great there. <laughs> she was doing really well in the damn tree and that damn apple, that damn snake, you know. And so the Course doesn't have anything about snakes and there's nothing in the Course about apples. And I told you, Jesus takes all of Genesis from the Bible, which is where all the snakes and apples are, and he just has one little phrase, into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. That's it. That's all you get. There's no apples, there's no snakes, there's no blaming Eve for, for ruining. You know, the Bible's a little strange, you know. Eve comes out of a rib of Adam, and then Eve, first of all, being born of a rib, and then being hung with this apple stuff and snake and betrayer, you know. It's a projection. It's a projection onto Eve of this unconscious guilt. It has nothing to do with a woman. It has nothing to do with a man or a snake or a garden. In fact, people will ask me, they say, well, wait a minute, there, that was in the Bible in Genesis. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God spoke to Adam and said, you can do anything you want here in paradise. This is paradise, but just one thing. Now, if you're a parent and you have a child and, and you tell the child, don't do this one thing, what is the child going to do? Okay, if you have a cookie jar in the kitchen and you say, listen, I'm going off, I've got to run some errands, watch TV, have a Coke, have a good time and everything, but just one thing. Uh, you see that cookie jar up there? On, I put it up nice and high. Uh, just make sure you don't have any cookies out of the cookie jar. Well, as soon as the parent, before the car is out of the driveway, the child has got the chair already over there. And, and then on top to the counter and then reaching, reaching. And the first thing to go for is the cookie jar. Now, in the Bible, it's got God speaking. Of course, God doesn't even know of this dream world. So God is just pure love. So God's not going to be saying to Adam, Listen, you're in paradise, enjoy it. I created you and Eve. I, you guys can have some fun, but and there's some fig leaves if you're concerned about your private thoughts and private parts, and here's some fig leaves. But go have at it. But listen, uh, just don't eat from this one tree in this garden of paradise. Now, I have problems even as a Christian with that story because that was not satisfying for me. I'm like, 
if God is so loving and God created paradise, why would you put a tree of good and evil if you're pure love? Why would you put a tree of good and evil in paradise? I got big problems with that, by the way. And then I get to A Course in Miracles, and there's Jesus Christ saying, God would never put you in such a position. Okay, I'm going to listen to you now, because whatever you're going to tell me, you're telling me that God had nothing to do with this separation. God would never put you in a position of this. You can believe you can separate from love, but you can't really separate from love. And even the original scribe, the scribe and her boss that collaborated to bring the course, Helen Shuckman and Bill Thetford, after they had, trans they had scribed a number of chapters, they, they just said to Jesus, before we go on with our scribing here, do you mind if we just ask one tiny question of you, Jesus? <laughs> and, and he said, yes, go ahead. And they said, how did this happen in the first place? If everything is all love and perfect love and oneness, how could this happen in the first place? And Jesus said, okay, good question. He said, if you look at your life as a human being and your emotional roller coaster ride, which is a quite a roller coaster ride of emotions. Anybody who's doing the human thing knows that there's, there's a range of emotions there, from terror to ecstasy, and there's and everything in between. He said, "You should know by your emotions and your range of different variety of the range of emotions. You should know that you believe that it happens." He's like telling them, you, you believe that it happened. So he's speaking them from a realm where he sees it's absolutely ridiculous. That's what a savior is. The savior is one that doesn't buy falsity, that has transcended completely all crazy, mad ideas. He's speaking and he's dictating this book from a place of perfect, pure love. Literally, from eternity. And it's coming through these words and being scribbled down in shorthand by Helen and typed out as they, they take it to the long version. And, and he's saying, you believe that it happened. So the entire Course in Miracles is written as if the impossible has occurred. The entire Course in Miracles is written for a mind that believes the impossible has actually occurred. If, if the mind was aware that, that love is all there is, or as the Beatles say, all you need is love. If the mind just knew what one line of the Beatles song meant, all you need is love, there would be no need for A Course in Miracles, there would be no need for spirituality, there would be no need for spiritual practice, there would be no need for any... Spiritual awakening would be ridiculous. It would be like, what's that? There's no such thing as spiritual awakening in heaven or nirvana because all is love, all is one, all is in the source. So this dream that you dream in secret is basically what is producing any kind of discomfort, conflict, upset, any struggle you've ever had in relationships, any struggle you've ever had with the environment, any struggle you've ever had with anything at all in all of your history, in all of your experiences. And if you believe in past lives, all the struggles you've had in all your past lives and in this life, and all your future lives is still coming from one thing, and that's this unconscious guilt. It's, it's all coming from one thing. Now, wow, we're here together, and that's why I'm telling you all this, because we have been called to transcend this unconscious guilt. We have been called because not only is it possible, it is inevitable. Absolutely inevitable. That's our destiny to be free. We, we are talking about these ideas from the Matrix and from the 13th floor and from the Truman Show and Dark City and all this. We're talking about all these ideas because now is the time to wake up. And to do that, you have to allow this darkness to come into your mind and not be frightened by it because it's not... 
so frightening when you start to realize that it can and must be healed, and that that is your purpose, is to heal your mind. It's almost like, bring it on, is what I did at one point. When I started to discover all this, and I finally started to tune in with Jesus, then I said, okay, bring it on. Pat Benatar, hit me with your best shot. Oh, come on, hit me with your best shot. Fire away. You have to be willing in your mind to, to say, hit me with your best shot. And the ego is like, you know who you're talking to here? I'm the devil. I am Satan. How dare you say, hit me with your best shot? You know, boo. I'm supposed to scare you. You're supposed to be afraid of me. You better, you must be on to something. What are you on? <laughs> I'm on Jesus. <laughs> I'm on the Holy Spirit. I'm on, I'm on heaven's track. And, and that's why I'm saying hit me with your best shot. Because I'm saying I'm not going to play this game anymore of hiding. When I don't feel good, I'm not going to hide it anymore. If I have to cry, I'll cry. If I have to go out to the woods and scream, I'll have to go out to the woods and scream. In fact, what are all the arts for? Why are, why are movement meditations so good? Because it lets up the unconscious. Why is meditation so good? It lets up the unconscious. Why do we do a number of things that are called like the arts? Why do we have music? Why do we have movies? Why do we like expression? It's because it helps us work out and, and let up the emotions. I was just watching a, a movie uh, some weeks ago, and it was a documentary on uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and it's called Above Us Only Sky. And in the movie, uh, they have this big mansion, white mansion over in England on 99 acres, and, and George Harrison comes over driving his car, and they, all these people start showing up, and all these musicians are there, and John is basically channeling. I mean, he's channeling the song Imagine, and he's channeling a whole bunch of songs for their album that the Plastic Ono Band uh, are going to put out. And at one point, John's there talking, and John's got anger. He is really angry. He's there in the studio, he's got his guitar, he's smoking his cigarettes, Yoko, they're all smoking cigarettes, and they're puffing away, and, this, and we're getting a good glimpse of legendary songwriters, what doing what? They're using their songwriting to let the unconscious mind up. He's writing his song so he can let up the love and he can let up the hatred. He can let up, I'm just a jealous guy, you know? They asked him in an interview, they said, you're talking about love and peace and everything. What's all this jealousy got to do with it? I thought you're supposed to love everyone, John. He said, well, yeah, and then I fell in love with Yoko. Now I'm possessive. I have to have her just for me. <laughs> Nobody come close to Yoko. She's mine, you know. And so he said, that's the way it is in relationships. Isn't that what we've gone through? You know, we're all peace, love, love everyone. Kumbaya, mama, kumbaya. All you need is love. Da, 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 da. You know, <laughs> give me love, give me love, give me peace on earth. Give me life, give me life, keep me. Freeze a bird. These are the same ones. The Beatles, George Harrison, you know. Once they get into a relationship, John, it's gone. Oh, he goes like, oh, give me, yeah, I'll show you. I'm just a jealous guy. Oh, yeah. I'm just a jealous guy. Oh, oh, look out. <laughs> you, know? you see, he goes like, oh, yeah. I can get you. You think you're so loving? Boom. <laughs> I'll send in Yoko, and we'll see how, how unconditional loving you are. So, to get back to my point, he, he's writing these songs, and he wakes up one day, and he is so angry at Paul McCartney. He is pissed off, because Paul has gone his way with, with wings, you know, with his wife, and, and John's got Yoko, and the Beatles have broken up, and all of England is crying. All of the world is crying. The Beatles! How can they break up? You know, it's a, it's a major breakup thing. Everybody's sad for the Beatles. How could they break up? They've only been together for some years. And he starts to write this song where basically it's a rant against Paul McCartney. And the other band members that are there, uh, 
The only song you did was yesterday. And and the other band members are playing along and thinking, like, yesterday, that's that's Paul McCartney. <laughs> How do you sleep at night, you cunt? You know, I mean, these are <laughs> John Lennon's lyrics, you know, and the band's playing along going. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they go up to John afterwards and they go, yeah, it looks like uh, you're really angry <laughs> at Paul McCartney. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I just had dinner with him last week and we're, 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 still, we're still good buddies. We love each other and everything. He said, but I, I've got a lot of anger coming up, man, and I'm using my music. I'm using my music to work this out. I love John, but I, you know, and we're good. I just said dinner with him, but I'm, but I've got some, some anger and hatred coming up, and I'm using my music to heal. And that's why we have the arts. That's why all of us, in in our own ways, we've been interested in song and dance and theater. We've been in, interested in novels and literature. We've been interested in all kinds of art and expression because, because why? Because they're cathartic. That's why we like movies. We watched a movie last night. That was cathartic for us. And then there was all these signs and symbols, like we all brought, were brought together for a very important purpose, and somehow we're, there's a communal, there's like a vibrational connection that we have that's somehow very important, even though this configuration has never come before on the planet. It came together and we're all just there looking at each other going, wow, there's something important here that's happening. Because there is one that is orchestrating time and space in the most glorious way and it may seem to take millions of years before everything completely disappears from awareness. But we're not concerned about the millions of years because our calling is to wake up and we have a very important calling. This is very, very important. This is for the whole universe. This is not for a group or a country. It's not about studying A Course in Miracles. It doesn't even matter whether you ever pick up the book or not, because I'm giving you this cliff notes. I'm giving you the full download. I'm giving you the whole package of, of 33 years of working with the Course. I'm transmitting it to you so you can take that download and you can apply that download in your life because it's so important. Because we have been called and we are to answer that call. Now, I feel like we are, I know for me, I've, I've been doing um, digital stuff for a while and I think about maybe 10 or 15 years ago they, they started calling me tech mystic. It, like, you're like one of those mystics of prophets of old, like Isaiah or John the Baptist or something, but you're, you're in a different era now than John the Baptist was back in Jesus' time. You're a tech mystic. But we can use technology in this awakening. Like we did last night, we watched a, a digital movie. We brought it down on a hard drive, we prayed on it. We didn't even realize that Luis was talking about the ark. You know, None of us, we, we're all clueless, but we all come together and then we, we seem to be in an ark and we're all like, oh, this seems to be like an ark, <laughs> except it's a tile ark. That was a wood ark. We were really in the right room for that movie. But it was so strong. It was such a strong symbol. It was on my, yeah, I know you're feeling all these things, and look, turn the lights on. <laughs> ah, my gosh. It was a perfect movie for us because it was such a strong symbol. So I feel like we are drawn together because we are to walk with each other in answering this call. Maybe we not the bodies won't all be living in the same place, but but even through digital means, we're there for love, support, nurturing. I'm also here to encourage you in your relationships and your collaborations. Like once you see how important this is then you see, I've got something that's important for me to give and extend. And it's not for me alone. I, this is not a lonely journey. In fact, Jesus says in The Course in Miracles, He says, the lonely journey to God fails because it excludes the one that it would embrace. 
you can't, if you think this is like a solo journey, like you're Luke Skywalker and you're going into the Death Star and it's only you, and you've got to take out this giant Death Star, you've got to take out Darth Vader and this giant Death Star all by yourself. In the movie, you know, it seems that way. He's in his little solo capsule and, and then he hears to take his hands off the instrument panel and use the force. So even there, use the force, use the spirit. You're not going to make a direct hit on this ego without help. Don't think that you are going to be like the hero of the dream and you have some kind of messiah complex and now you've got the, the package of information, now you've got to go on the hero's journey and, and conquer the ego and, and take away this unconscious guilt all by yourself. No, it's we do it in a collaborative way. We're all in this together. Even this, I have found when I discovered this, that as soon as I started to pray and get in touch with this, then, yeah, Francis shows up, and then Francis devotes her whole life to this purpose. And Sava shows up, was that like a little bit over three years ago? You were living in a, like a one room by yourself in an apartment with your boys, and they each had their rooms, but in Copenhagen, and then in a little bit over three years, it's been a, yeah, they were saying, you speak pretty good English, and you said, well, I do now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, we're called to make our own contribution, and what does that even mean? How do we make our contribution? Well, I was saying last night, Mark was asking that, I, you were saying, I still see myself as seducing in, in different way, sexually, or business, or just all kinds of different ways, and I said, no, no, it's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit seducing your mind to wake up, it's not, you, you don't have to carry the heavy burden of, I'm a seducer, <laughs> you're, you're going to follow the great seducer, <laughs> it's going to seduce you back into the light, but that was an important piece of the puzzle too, because then I told you that, that even when you have ego beliefs and structures, that even those ego preferences will get used in the plan of waking up. That's how much the Spirit loves us. Like, for example, in my life, you know, I was in my 20s, late 20s, and finishing up 10 years of university, and if Jesus had said to me, okay, you have to start unlearning everything you believe in, I've and I did have that feeling. But then if he would have said, now, I want you to take up yoga, tai chi, I want you to go on a microbiotic diet, uh, oh, he'd have lost me, no sex. I mean, he would have lost me really quick. Yeah, maybe the next lifetime. You got the wrong guy. <laughs> I mean, but, Instead of having me take up yoga, tai chi, this and this, and sexuality and everything, he guided me into relationship. He guided me into use my tennis as my tai chi. He, he said, just keep, quit keeping score when you play tennis. Mm -hmm. And go out there and let me play tennis through you so you can come into the zone. I'll show you the zen game of tennis here. And we can, I can use the tennis in your mind training. Do you like tennis? Great. I'll use it. Do you like to play basketball? I'll use it. He basically said, if, if he uses the sports that I like, he would wash them free of all the competition. And yet, I could still have the enjoyment of hitting the tennis ball, shooting the basketball, doing everything. He would just wash it free of all competition. Because that's where the guilt is reinforced, when we compete. God doesn't compete. So he, he was like, and with your food, you know, he said, well, you've already experimented with vegetarianism, and I'm not going to throw you on a microbiotic diet, I'm not going to scare you, anything like that. He said, I will give you a really strict diet that will be very, very helpful in your mind training, so you have to follow this completely. And I was like, what? What is the diet? <laughs> and he said, I'm going to take you on the road and we'll travel and we'll meet many people. And he said, I'm giving you a very strict diet because 
I want you to realize that it's not about the food, it's about the joining, it's about the love, it's about the connecting. Okay, that sounds good. What's the strict <laughs> diet? He says, you're going to travel, you're going to go into many houses, you'll meet many people, you'll be traveling to many places, many countries. At the time, just I was thinking of all the places in the United States. And here is your diet. Eat whatever is served. That's the diet? That's right. Whatever is served. Do not put the food as an obstacle between your hosts. You're being welcomed into a house. You're being given a place to sleep. You're being loved. And that host is going to cook or do whatever they do. And you have food preferences from growing up in the Midwestern United States. You're a meat and potato guy. And I'm taking you on the road. And you now will eat whatever is served. Whatever is on that plate, you are going to eat it with a big smile. And you're going to thank the host for the food. You know, what do you think Peace Cobra, when she walked around, do you think she was picky in the food that she ate? You know, you, you think mystics and saints who go and follow spirit are, are going to be picky about the food they eat? No, they're going to let the food be used to clear away the, the preferences. And that's what he was wanting to do. But again, the whims, you know, I like strawberry pie. Jesus was out of getting strawberry pie from the host. I was, I actually was my friend Lisa when I was up in Pennsylvania. I've been doing this eat what's whatever served for years at that time. But I went up to her house, and I, I went to her house, and she said, "I want to do a gathering at my house, and I'll invite my friends, my my staff from where I work, and everything." And she said, "But right now, she just smiled and looked at me, and she said, I want to cook you your." favorite food. And at that point, I just looked at her and I said, well, what's your favorite food? And she said, steak. <laughs> and I said, why don't you cook me your favorite meal, whatever it is, and we'll enjoy the meal together. So that's how it went from, let me cook you your favorite food. And I said, why don't you cook us your favorite food? I didn't even have to know what it was. Because I'm in eat whatever served, and I want her to feel the joy. And if she's going to take the time to cook something, put this care into it, then you cook your favorite food. And we feasted on a big, thick steak, and she made lots of things. We had a joyful time, and we had a joyful gathering. And I say diet because that is a diet. Eat whatever is served is definitely a diet. It's just not one you probably haven't heard of very often. You, you know keto diet and you know macrobiotics, but eat whatever is served diet. Now I have to say, here we are in South America. That's, that's when it got fun because I said to go to Colombia and then I was out in rural Colombia. And sometimes I would look at what was served and uh, there was some insects on that plate in rural Colombia. And I would be like, Okay, crunchy. <laughs> okay, boss. <laughs> I'm with you. Crunch, crunch, crunch. You know. But the thing that was beautiful about that is that you do grow stronger inside from any discipline. And that was a very powerful discipline because I could feel the love behind it. Jesus was just saying, don't separate. Don't go in. Do you have any of this? Oh, I can't have this. And oh, it's this. And I can't have this and this. You know, it's like I really learned to just make it all about the joining and not about the food. That's really why Jesus gave me that diet. And I do have to say, I had a lot of unconscious food preferences that I was totally unaware of. Oh, by traveling to all these places, I, I quickly learned what my food preferences were. They were flush from the hiding place into the conscious mind in a quick way. Because, because I would be thinking, oh, I'm yearning for this and yearning for that. And the funny thing is, when I would be yearning for something, it would show up. Jesus was like, oh, you really want a piece of blueberry pie? Well, here you go, here's your blueberry pie. The host would offer me blueberry pie or something. 
I mean, I went down to South America, and I would be sitting there in Colombia, and the whole group around me and everything, and they go, come on, David, tell us what you like to eat. Come on, come on, tell us, tell us. Because I was basically eating whatever served, and so they would really push me, push me, push me, and then finally I'd go, helados. And they go, ice cream, helados. And so for like two weeks, <laughs> Well, you and Antonio took me to the ice cream place here in Sao Paulo. Yeah. I mean, there's all the halatas came. And, and one time I let slip pizza. Oh, okay, pizza party. You know, because people have so much love in their heart, they, they want to share the moment with you in something that you enjoy. But Jesus was okay with that. He was okay with letting me let that slip, you know, because it was still just trust and flow and eat with what's served. And, and the other thing was sleep wherever a bed or whatever is offered. Uh, sleep with whatever is offered, yeah. Okay. Uh, about food and vegeta uh, to be vegetarian. This is your journey. This is what you, you listen in your uh, guidance. guidance. Yeah. There is no one journey, like for me. Uh, I stop to eat meat, then I eat it again, then I stop it again. And I realized that for me, no meat is better for my journey. Yeah. But uh, I agree to, I totally agree that uh, when people offer you, you eat what, what is there for you. Like, you can do uh, an expe uh, um, it's a song, ex exception. You can do this. Uh, radicalism is a problem, like, it's an issue. But in my journey, and there is, uh, and I, I, I think about like the problem in the world, uh, about the, fall, the, the rainforest yeah. and the, all the, and this is the same uh, point that you that, that you are, uh, are talking about about racist and all the problems in the world. Okay, it's illusion, but um, if you say this to everybody, everybody is going to eat meat, 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 and they are not in the same point of view. Yeah. So let's go. Let's follow the master. They are. You are saying this. He eat meat and let's follow the master. No guilt, okay? But I think we have to follow our guidance. Our yeah. Oh, I totally agree. This is just a parable, actually, from many, many years ago at the beginning, and now the appetites for me have gone away. So it's not so much. It's, just, it's really getting to be eat or don't eat. Uh, it's a different, it's a whole different thing. Most of the masses would say, that's crazy. You know, that's not, that's a terrible issue, whether you should even eat or not. You know, they say, what, are you going to fast all the time? And and I would say the same thing Jesus says. I have mana from heaven. I have prana, mm -hmm. if you like the Eastern uh, phrase better than the mana. This is Jewish phrase. But, yeah, this is not a prescription of behavior. But I am telling the parable just in terms of the softness of how, at the beginning, Jesus was basically saying, I'm taking you on an inward journey, and it's highly individualized. Yeah. It's highly individualized. So what I go through in my parable is not a recommendation. I don't tell people what to yeah, eat. Besides all the moralism, I feel more connected with the source, yeah. with no means. Yeah, yeah. And you've, you've, you've just done that and, and learned. So I would say, what we're saying is follow your intuition, and I would say you're intuitively eating now with what feels best, most helpful. You don't. Have, you're not even trying to justify with moral issues and all these other yeah. things. But, but just your intuitive guidance is is eating vegetarian because it, it And I always feel say to my friends, like I go anywhere. I can go in all restaurants. I can go. Don't don't care about my food when you invite me to your house. I always say this yeah. because I'm always concerned of, oh, this is a problem. <laughs> no, please, no, don't do this. But it's just my journey. I'm yeah. always concerned when Fernanda told me that you eat everything okay. 
There's no I, I always look at you drinking this Lipton ice you like, oh my god, okay. <laughs> it's more probably more accurate than that. I'm le eating less or nothing than eating everything. That, this was at the It's a lot of beliefs, at the beginning. Like, and you, yeah. you are in another point. Yeah. Uh, over the, the borderland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just using these as examples to, to try to make a point about how the spirit will undo this ego belief system through guidance, intuition, which is what you're saying, really. You're basically saying intuitive. I went through a phase where I actually started, I just was completely vegetarian. And so my family at first were like, because they were the yeah. meat and potato family. Uh, and so they were like, mmm. And then, but they they were so loving. Then they would they would invite me to family gatherings and they'd cook everything regular. And then they'd have little David portions of the casserole, vegetarian. It was very loving, actually, because they loved me. They actually were that way. But I, I wasn't ever trying to go like you. I was the same way. I didn't go with friends and try to make a big issue around the food. So in one sense, it's, it's all I'm doing is telling these early parables is just as an example that it's, it's perfectly wonderful to be intuitive. And then as you're intuitive, the Spirit will use what you believe in in ways that will help you loosen your mind from the ego, is basically the whole thing. Just remember you telling it in your When I was in India and I went to Varanasi to see the the um, the sunrise, the sunrise, like four in the morning with the boat. And I was alone in my boat and it was so beautiful and so. And then uh, it was like a miracle moment and I was with my boat uh, rider and then there was this big boat with a lot of Indian women and they were like, come here, come here, and I was having like this wonderful state of mind and I'm, I'm with miracle I'm connected and they said they wrapped me come in my boat and there were a lot of them and they were eating and everyone in India said you don't eat other food take care of it with spice with water I was like really taking care and they gave me the food they were like taking pictures come here and I was what am I doing I was connected and they gave me the food and I couldn't say no and and then I had to eat that food I didn't like it but I was sharing they were sharing And then I understood, like, connection, uh, that's exactly what I said. It's not about being alone in the boat. It's like you're it together is. and yeah, you're yeah. going to eat the food, <laughs> whatever it is. And I yeah. didn't, it was so, because I was so um, beautiful, my sunrise and everything is beautiful. <laughs> and then I was, like, wrapped in this boat with a lot of crazy women taking pictures and they making me eat a lot of things. Yeah. And then, the sauce okay. Beans, all the germs, all the salt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's all, we have beliefs and, and we have to slowly be lifted from our ego beliefs. Not yanked, but, but slowly. Yes. And that was a perfect example of how afterwards you were like, oh, wow. That, that and I was that, together. Yeah. I had people yeah. around me. That yeah. was like, for me, that was maybe the, the biggest lesson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's beautiful because it, the, it's highly individualized. And, the, and because it's so highly individualized, you can start to really relax. Like, that's what, you know, Roberto was saying, I, I have not done wrong. I cannot mess this up, but I have never done anything wrong, really, in the past, ever. And, <laughs> and then, when you start to feel that, then, then you really relax. You start to really enjoy your guided journey through life, you know, because it's only this belief that we've somehow done something wrong, that we've messed up, and that we have to be cautious and careful. And we get too cautious and careful with things, and then we start to close down. And uh, it's funny because uh, when I started to study uh, Ecclesia Miracles, I struggled a lot with this because I was a vegetarian and my family was like yours, like uh, the lunch and dinner, they prepare my food, like spalinhas, and then I changed my mind because we are here in the world, we are used to follow rules. And I wanted rules, like like no meat, no, I wanted to rules to follow. And then Jesus was telling me, like, the only rule is love. I was like, what? <laughs> love, and, and it completely changed my, my way of uh, living and to the things. 
and I got very emotional when you were talking because uh, he did the same to me, but not about food, about people. And I just realized that um, I had struggle with my mother-in-law and my Gabrielle family. And I just realized that it's like food or sex or our only subjects, our only issues. For me, this lesson that it told touched my heart because you're telling about a big lesson of surrender and gratitude and um, building trust. Like, it's not about the food, it's not about the sex. So this is our only world issues, like, subject. And uh, I was like, oh my God, I'm still struggling because I judge them. I... I wanted to be alone sometimes. I don't want to go in this lunch, and I felt terrible. And then I felt his love because many times I was like arguing with him, like what I'm doing here, like in this family, like crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> and now, like uh, hearing you, I felt his love because he he teach me, like he was only teach me. I was like judging and. And say no, not only not for the food, but for the people. And yeah, this is so beautiful. And sometimes it's really hard for us when we put our preferences um, before, right? To see his love. Yeah. Because sometimes it, it seems like, um, yeah, it seems like he's, he's going uh, far from our um, preference. But as the book says, like, my only preface is God. It's yeah. like, we have the same preface. So sometimes it's hard yeah. to see this when we stuck with one individual preference, preference. And it was very clear for me. Thank you. Yeah. It's helpful also to hear when we have something we're struggling with, um, like Mark brought up the thing of pride, pleasure, and attack, there's a beautiful line that comes and says, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. Yeah. And we all go, mm, right. <laughs> you see, because he gives it to us from the highest of high. And we go, oh, I know that's true. And it's the same with the preferences. Okay, it, all the preferences are of the ego because there is no order of difficulty in miracles. And that's why Jesus could seem to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out uh, demons, heal leprosy, mental issues, people would be wild and crazy, if they'd come to him, calm. It didn't matter, you know, we have a in mental illness, you know, the, the DSM-3, the DSM-4, in psychology, that we have thick books diagnosing all the mental illnesses that there are on the planet. To Jesus, the whole book, he can, he can take on anything because all illnesses, physical illness, illnesses are really mental because they're all, everything's ori originating in this guilt in the mind. So there aren't, there's no such thing as a physical ailment. It's all mental. Jesus tell, teaches us that all illness is mental illness. Based on what I've been telling you, that's why. Because everything originates in the mind. But the, but the key thing is with the preferences, of course, they're generated from the ego, and what comes with preferences is expectations. If you go to a restaurant, and the reason you go to this one particular restaurant is because you don't even have to see the menu, because you know when you go in this restaurant, you're going to order a certain thing. That's why you go to the restaurant, because you want to get your favorite food. And if you go in there, and you sit down, and you're kind of... Oh, yeah, menu, forget it. Give me the regular, and they say, sorry, we, we don't have it. You know, you see your heart drop again, like, but I came to this restaurant for one purpose. No, you came to that restaurant for forgiveness. You actually came to that restaurant to learn to drop your preferences. I mean, once you start to realize that that's what the lesson's about, I remember one time I went into a restaurant and the waitress came and brought uh, the menu to the table and I, I looked and I could see she was really nervous. She was, I could see her, she was shaking and I thought, hmm, I bet this is her first 
nice. And so she would go by and she'd come up and she was really frightened and she would come. So when she came the next time, I'd say, is this your this first night on the job? And she said, yes, it's I. She said, I'm terrified. So the spirit cued me in that she was terrified. And then the more she would come, she would bring the menus and I would say, well, what do you recommend? And really draw her in, really start connecting and relating with her because she's calling for love. She's just terrified. I'm not there really that interested in the food or what she brings and this and this. And then when she came around two or three times and she brought, started bringing some stuff, um, she was afraid that she would like spill the drinks or spill the food or something. And finally when she came by and she she looked at me and she put something down and I said, listen, I said, you could even spill the drink and spill the food all over my lap and I'm still going to give you the biggest tip. <laughs> Big smile. <laughs> you know, it's all about the interaction. It's all about teach only love. It's not about the food. It's not about the service. It's, it's about the love. Imagine if you went on shopping to grocery stores. I've been in grocery store lines where people start complaining because you have like a new cashier who's having trouble doing it and everything. And, and when I finally get up there, you know, I just, I enjoy that encounter because basically what I'm telling her in my mind and my heart is, I love you, relax, you're doing a great job. Don't be concerned about time, about, you know, how fast the line is moving. And, and you can see people start to smile and light up because what do we all want to hear? We all want to hear we're doing a good job, we're loved. So that's why it's so important to loosen from these ego preferences because they interfere with the love. We cannot consistently love if we get too caught up in these preferences because preferences always come with expectations. And you know how it is when you have expectations with anybody. You know, you, you've got an agenda. If you have expectations, you have an agenda. And if you have an agenda, you can't love. You can't love unconditionally. So that's why I'm saying it's not, preferences aren't evil, it's just that they're, that's the baseline. We all have to deal with those ego preferences, but we want the Holy Spirit to do that. Jesus. Um, I have a, like, some concept that I've been struggling with in this last um, and it's all to do with uh, Jesus healing a uh, disease, for example. So the question is pretty much, how come if everything is already designed, or even going uh, backwards in, in time, how come my mind controls anything? Like, not control, but how come I can change anything with my mind if it's already written? Isn't it an illusion as well? So what actually is my mind doing if it's already written? So that's... Yeah. yeah, and the connection with the quantum field and the quantum yeah. physics and yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a trick. Um, anything that seems to involve change in the world, even symptom removal, some people would say, well, that's a pretty good trick. If somebody's got cancer one minute, and then the next minute they, mm -hmm. they brighten up and they don't have any cancer cells, that's a pretty good trick. But Everything in this world is symbolic, so around Jesus, because his mind was so quantum, so high, he, he wasn't personally healing anyone. In fact, he would say that when people, the woman came up to him behind him that time and touched, touched the hem of his garment, and he said, who touched me? You know, basically he's just radiating unconditional love. He's radiating pure spirit. And then people come to him, and to the extent, in their mind, they're open to what he's teaching, they were healed. When he went back to Nazareth, where he was born and raised, there were no miracles. Why were there no miracles? It seems like there should be miracles wherever he goes, but there were no miracles in Nazareth. It's because when Jesus goes back to Nazareth, the people don't see the Messiah. They see, that's Jesus. I watched you grow up from a little boy, and now, ooh, you're the Messiah, ooh. <laughs> I know, your parents, Mary and Joseph, don't give me this Messiah, ooh. <laughs> and they didn't have the faith, and there were no miracles, because they saw a boy grown into a man, and in their eyes, he was just a man. Believe me, he was not just a man, he's right here with us right now. In fact, the closest 
you'll ever get to Jesus is not 2,000 years ago. It's right now. He's right here with us, very present with us, and this is as close as you'll get to him. You will never get to him by studying a historical figure because that part has to be forgiven. Would, would unconditional love be a man? Of course not. Would unconditional love be a woman? Of course not. If the ego made the body, how could unconditional love be a man or a woman? It did use the puppet of Jesus to speak. And that's why he said, before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All those things, that was the Holy Spirit. That was the universal spirit speaking through the puppet. But it doesn't mean that the universal spirit was the puppet. And when the puppet was gone, the universal spirit wasn't gone. It's, Jesus is here with us right now, very strongly with us. But when there seems to be symptom removal or changes that take place, all those are our effects. And they can be reflections of your mind. So, for example, as you go along and you become more and more quantum and more and more into quantum fields, along the way you may see a lot of smiling faces. You may see happy, what you think are very happy scenes. They may get happier and happier and happier. But in the end, you start to realize that the world is not outside your mind. So, what could the change in the world really mean? The change in your mind means everything. But change in the world is just like a, a seeming change. But what is happening in my mind is already written as well, or no? Yeah, it, it, everything in form is, is the past. So, for example, your question is a good one, but in, in we told you that in the Course in Miracles there's a text and then there's a workbook that Francis mentioned, 365 lessons, and then there's a manual for teachers. In the workbook, you're talking about lesson number seven. The first lesson she mentioned, didn't you go through the lesson number one? A few of them. Nothing I see means anything. Well, that fits in what we're talking about. That's lesson number one. Lesson number seven is I see only the past. Meaning, everything you perceive in the whole cosmos is the past. And remember I was talking about Nostradamus, you know, seemingly reading the future, centuries before things were even invented and happened. He was just reading Akasha, the Akashic records, because everything is past. Everything that's to come is, is past. Everything that seems to have already happened is past. So when we deal with the world, we're dealing with something that it, Jesus says it's already over and gone. You're, you're reliving, you're still reliving this crazy mad idea, and it's already been healed. It's already been handled. It's not like it will be handled, it has been handled. And he's like saying, would you please follow my instructions so you can realize that it's over. As long as you still think it's yet to come, then there's going to be worries and concerns. You know, that's what all health insurance is about. All this doing exercises and doing all, eat right, exercise right, do all these things, because people are, are afraid that there could be things that could happen to the body in the future that they don't like. But that's still a time issue, that's still believing that, that it's, it's still actually to come. It's really deep, so, so what it is is you're not meant to try to intellectually, it looks like you're like, <laughs> no, no, that's not. No, this, believe me, it's like all he's trying to do is encourage you in the direction. But I will tell you what lesson number eight says. It's lesson number seven is I see only the past. Lesson number eight is my mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. You see how he brings it? He's not going to leave you hanging there just saying, oh yeah, you're just watching what's already over and done. He's telling you, no, it's because your mind is preoccupied with past thoughts, and you're seeing the past world. Let's use the analogy of a, of a movie theater. When you go to a movie, the, the light is in the projector, the film goes through, and then this is an old time projector, not the digital ones nowadays, but it's an old metaphor. But the, the film, the light goes through the film, and the shadows go on the screen. And when you're at a movie, you usually forget that you're watching a movie. You, you're there to be engaged as if something's really happening. 
but actually it's just a bunch of shadows on the wall. And these shadows are all past, right? The, the movie's already been shot. The, the movie was shot and edited, and you're just watching the images on the screen that are all past. You're just watching the past. Now, some people, of course, forget that. You know, it's a Julia Roberts, and she's walking down the hall, and there's some guy with a gun at the end of the hall, and you're like talking to the screen. You're saying, Julia, oh, stop. Don't go down the stop. He's behind that door over there. Don't go there. You know, you know, this is what people do in the movie theaters. They don't. Oh yeah, just a bunch of shadows, shadows, shadows. You're not going to pay like a lot of money to go shadows, shadows. It's not. But, but they're entertained because they like, they get engaged. They forget that they're watching a movie. And Jesus is telling us, yeah, that's why you need mind training. Because you've forgotten that you're watching a movie. You're, you're watching a dream. You're watching something that's already over, but you still think it's happening. And just like in a the movie theater, when you get involved with the characters, you think it's happening. You, you, you don't think, you're not aware that it's over. You're, you're watching it, it's, just, it's active. So... We are all thinking that we are Julia Roberts. Like, <laughs> yes, we all think we're, we're the characters. And that's why we get concerned. Somebody tells us, oh, be careful when you go to a such and such a city. Oh, where are you going? Oh, that's a bad part. Bad part of the city. And I thought... If I think that way, why would I travel the world and go to all kinds of places and jump onto boats when they they grab you? You would have, you wouldn't really do anything. You would just probably stay in the safest room and the safest place. You know, you would do that. She's screamed out. We are <laughs> like uh, if we are living the past, when we connect with love and uh, with the source in this time we clean we, sh we turn off the best this is like we, we turn off oh, when you release the guilt and we connect with the love like we are living the past now but well, we you're kind of asking where is it going imagine that I mean for example there's been a field of psychology has been around for a long time and then After Freud and Skinner and all these other ones, you know, they came to this different types of psychology. But but para, let's talk about parapsychology. But even when we when we when you feel the guidance, is it the best? Is this is it the best? Yes, yes it is. Yes, yes. Oh, it's the best. The same when you walk from the beach backwards, you like. You know, washing yeah, up the your steps. Yeah, but yeah, they need it to stream though. Like, you correct your like, perception. This is, right? this is a mug. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at a mug, and according to like the theory and everything is my mind and my ego. So if I concentrate and I think myself, like, this eventually could be like a dog. But how come? Am I actually changing anything or not? Because if it's already written, like, I think this is, can turn into a dog, but actually it's, it's, I can't do anything because if it's supposed to be a dog, it's already coming about anyway. That's yeah. yeah, the problem isn't the cup or the dog. Here's the problem. The problem is the belief in cups and dogs. Because God didn't create cups or dogs. Uh, the problem is that you think that objects can exist in and of themselves. Like again, I was talking about that table last night, or let's take this uh, glass, it seems like a glass of water. Now, in order to go into healing, you have to go into your mind so deeply that you let go of all ideas. Like, for example, there's memories. Like, if you look at this, then you probably see that it's a glass of water. And what would happen if I let go of that? You have, you're all thinking of what would happen. You, you already have memories of what glasses do when they're full of water and they're dropped on a tile floor, you see? There's a lot of past associations. I don't even have to do it. There's a channel for, for fear. It's, that's right. That's where all the fear comes in, is giving false meaning. That's lesson number two from the Course. I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. But I you can forget about it. That this could eventually fluctuate. Like it could eventually levitate. For yeah, but it wouldn't matter. A floating cup 
and a, and a, a <laughs> cup so in my concept. hand are the same. Yeah. In fact, because you're still seeing it as external. It's not yeah. Yeah. It's not about the form. It's about the way we look at the form. Will I see the whole tapestry? Imagine if you had a, a quilt on a, on a bed. And it had many colors and many forms and shape in it. And then Jesus is just saying, now will you look at this tapestry with me? Because he sees it different than the shapes and the colors and the, the forms. He sees the electric quantum field. Everything is completely unified. So it's, it, it isn't what it seems to be. So the whole problem is seeing with the ego is, like I was saying yesterday, the ego makes up the images which are still in the mind. This, this cup has not left the mind. This is, Plato talked about this. You know, he, Plato, I love these Greek philosophers are fantastic. Plato, one time he was sitting in the pool with his friends. We should all be, we should, next time we come together, Louis, we should pool. have us at a pool. <laughs> we should have us all in a big warm pool. We'll get our bathing suits. We, Plato was sitting in the pools with all of his friends, and then one day Plato said, if there were no red objects in the cosmos, in the world, would the idea of red still exist? This is the kind of stuff that the Greeks would think about. Yeah. If there were no red objects ever, anywhere, would red still exist? It's kind of like that thing, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? You know, well, as you start going deeper into this, you start to realize that the sound of a tree falling in the forest would have to be generated from what? The mind. There's, there's no, what everything's pointing to is there is no, this is what quantum physics has been saying for the last eight decades, so we better wake up. I mean, this is not like it was invented last year. Yeah. Quantum physics is about eight decades old. It's time we start paying attention to these people, you know. They don't even know what's going on. They're mystified by it. We can help them. We can help ourselves by saying it's the mind, it's the mind, it's consciousness. But if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? It still depends on the perceiver, because all sights and sounds are generated from the mind. They don't have in, any independent existence. The, I think the struggle point is like, uh, for me, was like uh, when I'm trying to understand that, it's like I'm I'm still using my past memories to understand that. And the point is like the book offer invited us to another point of view. There is not, that's not, it's not your mind. It's a, it's a, it's a point, it's a different, right? It's outside. It's, it's like a, a metaphysical, a, like yeah, mystic. It's, it's still, it's mind, but it's not personal mind. No, no, it's yeah, not our individual mind. mind, individual mind. Can't, you can't, you know, sometimes people say, I can't wrap my head around it. I'm like, yeah, you'll yeah. never wrap your head around this stuff. <laughs> you won't be able to wrap your private mind and private thoughts around this stuff. The only way you can begin to feel the joy and the happiness is the surrender of, of the I know mind, of I think I know something. Uh, I realized something with maybe my biggest fear in surrender. In surrender. Uh, when you said about this movie, like I'm watching Julie Roberts and I'm, uh, with, with the, the connection I say fast, 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 fast. But in this world, I like to go into the movies and theater. I like engaging it. That makes me feel fun. Like yesterday, we saw the movie, and I was engaged to the yeah. character. Yes. I was having fun. My fear is, uh, I think I know, I know it's from ego, but I want to understand. When I watch the movie and watch reality, and I see pass, 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 will I still be able to have fun and to connect? Because my illusion in my When I um, go to the movies and just see, no, this is past, this is past, this is past, this is past. Okay, I'm not connecting and I'm not engaging, I'm not having fun. It's like I'm separated. I'm just observing, and this idea of observing makes me separated. Separate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To the ego, it, the idea of just observing doesn't sound like fun at all. But if, out of all the trillions and gazillions of different seeming lifetimes, if we went back to that lifetime of Jesus maybe like 33, 34-year life, okay? You can't, the ego would, would always project like 
truth is boring, truth is bland, truth is not interactive. You know, of course it's going to do that because it wants to survive, it wants to exist, and, and it's going to interpret things. And some people have, like the ego would look back on Jesus' life and say, okay, he's Mary and Joseph, and he grows up, and then he goes through some things in puberty and, and adolescence like everybody, and this and this, and then somewhere maybe around 30 years old, it's like uh, he's, he doesn't even have apostles yet or, or disciples. He goes into this river with this guy, John the ba Baptist, the prophet, and he goes in, and then John the Baptist points, and John's got a huge following. John's got a big following. And here comes this guy with long hair, and he comes into the water, and John goes to all the followers, this is the one. <laughs> and half of them, more than half, go, Oh, God, I followed this guy, John, and now look, look at his point. Where's he from? Nazareth. Oh. <laughs> he's pointing at him like he's the Messiah, and he's from Nazareth. So it's like, so most of John's followers fell away because he went, This is the guy. And then he baptized. Jesus in the river of Jordan, and then the, the dove came down and landed on Jesus' head, and then this voice, the same voice that you heard, the big voice, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, from that point on, that wasn't really a man anymore. That was the universal spirit looking like appearing as if it's a man, but that was universal spirit. That was I am this. That's, that's, talk about let go of the past. That was, that was prior. That's the I am this that was before all history. And then when Jesus would go, and the apostles came and followed him, and when he would go into a synagogue, you know, Judaism is very much based on tradition. So they go all the way back to Abraham is like the father. And then when Jesus said the words, before Abraham was, I am, they were ready to get the rocks. That's almost like saying, your whole belief system, all your traditions, before your father, Abraham, in your history, I am. And they were really upset with him. I mean, they, they really got angry with him because that was the universal spirit beginning to undo the whole belief in linear time in the whole world. That was the beginning of the end of this world. Even though it's already over, he was demonstrating this presence that transcends time and space. So the key thing is, when we follow this, it's, it's not about not engaging. I always tell people, don't you don't have to try to get this intellectually. You still, if you feel to engage, engage. Just like when all those women were, were saying, come, 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 and you just surrendered and, and went. And there was a big lesson in that. It was a beautiful lesson. You don't have to be off on watching a sunrise, you know, to be peaceful. You can be in great joy in the middle of a bunch of women that you don't even know, eating food that you never eat. You know, you, you had a great experience. And that's the way Jesus is. Jesus is, is not really here to fix the world, change the world. It's not here to correct um, we were. I was talking to Patricia, and and I was saying, I really am in this state of mind where I, I do enjoy this observing the world without feeling the need to correct it and to correct people. Even you see how different that is from a lot of religions and spiritualities, where like you were saying, there's all the do's and the don'ts, and you have to eat meat or not eat meat or breathe this way, sit this way. You know, we're not, this isn't about changing the world, but this is about coming to an inner experience of, of peace. And understanding, because yeah. when we are here trying to understand, we are separated. We are like, um, we are in the past. When we surrender, we are just leaving, we are connected. Yeah. Yeah. I feel when I'm trying to understand, like I'm connected with my mind, I'm trying to understand, so I'm, I totally feel connected when I'm surrendering, yes. I don't try to understand. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Because we can't, we will never be able to intellectually understand any of this, so 
So that's why, even with the course, there's a, there's a workbook lesson. We're, we're doing the fast course here. There's a workbook lesson. Now we're jumping all the way from 7 and 8 to 189. Now we're, we're way back in the book, where he says, forget this world, forget this course. That's why I think all the flaws of this, they are not connected, because they are trying to understand everything, so... Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, yesterday what happened in that movie was such a, a good little demonstration because that movie, Louis has seen it, right? Mm -hmm. We know that movie was shot before that moment. And when you were talking about the arc and everything, suddenly the movie take on a completely different meaning to you and it was extremely meaningful. And why was that meaningful? You can't even put words to it because all of a sudden this shot this movie that was shot 10 20 who knows how many years ago was taking on a new meaning in that very moment as if you know this universe is connected with your mind and it's speaking directly to you mm -hmm. and do you have any need to change the movie no need because that was present experience and that is meaningful because that's that's what we live this life and the, the actual experience become Wow, this this whole world, see, yes, it's past and it's gone, it's shot many, many, many years ago, but there is a present connection to it. That's how the spirit uses it to speak to us so that it, it takes on so much meaning and so much love. That's why it's actually this book is called A Course in Miracles. And at the very beginning of the book, he actually defines what what is a miracle in this book, he used 50 principles to define it, and one of it is a miracle is an expression of love. So that becomes very clear, it's not even for miracle, because yesterday the miracle clearly is not form-based. It happens in the mind and then make you feel, oh my god, what? Suddenly, it's, it's suddenly there's an open love to an identity thing. And that is, you, you feel the love that the universe is talking to you and it's one of you, is speaking with you. And that is what, what we're striving for, you know, beyond all of this understanding and beyond all of this practice is that. And we can live the life in that way, like non-stop. That's the consistency. It's like deja vu that yeah. you had. Like, I've seen this, I've seen these faces, I've seen this moment. Imagine that that one deja vu started to happen more and more. And then it came more and more and more. That would start to take it a little bit towards this experience that has passed. But... It's just a peak, right? Like, yeah, it's a little... It's a little, you. a little glimpse. And so it's beautiful that we have these glimpses. We can celebrate the glimpses, but we don't... I, th that would be the biggest problem like, for example, The Course in Miracles was dictated from Jesus between 1965 and 1972. So, the book was published around 1976, so here we are in 2019, heading for 2020. It's been around for a while. But the biggest problem that the students of A Course in Miracles have is intellectual understanding. They read this big book like they read any book. And they try to use their mind and their past reference points and their past concepts to understand the book. But on the one hand, Jesus Jesus says this is this course is not a play of ideas. But on the other hand, he's saying he's saying that, for example, in the in the manual for teachers, clarification of terms. Jesus says, the ego will ask many questions that this course has no answer for. How did the impossible happen? To whom did the impossible happen? And many forms. So he, Jesus is even coming straight out and saying, Your, the ego will come up with questions that this course has no answer for. Of course, that's a sneaky question. How did the impossible happen? Because Jesus know. knows that it didn't. <laughs> and it, it can never be answered. But to most people, they're like, yeah, that seems like a pretty good <laughs> question. He's saying, no, the, the Course will never answer that. But then he says, an experience will come that will end your doubting. An experience will come that will end your doubting. He doesn't say a theology will come and end your doubting. He never says, oh, a book will come along. You, aha, no more doubts. Aha. <laughs> 
Did you read that book? Yeah, I read it. Do you have any more doubts? No. Do you have any problems? No. I read the book. So he's saying, oh, you have to practice. Just like any, there are many beautiful pathways to God. The Course is just one among many beautiful pathways. Yeah, I still need the apple to follow yeah. the experience. Yes, yeah. it's, it's highly individualized. Yeah. And, and the thing about it is, that's what we want to encourage each other, to go for this experience, to, to nurture each other, to be supportive, to, to encourage and cheer each other on, not to try to pick each other apart and say, this is right and this is wrong. That's, how's that going to help us? None of us likes to be evaluated. You know, we're, we're here for instruction. We're here to share. Maybe we try something and it, we have a great experience. We share the experience. Maybe it's helpful. But we, we are not really here to judge and evaluate. That's, that's the whole thing. I love this phrase from Al-Sufi. It resumes very well this. To obtain knowledge, add things every day. To obtain wisdom, remove things every day. Yeah. It's like this. It's just release and yeah. just be, be still. Yeah. Just live by being and then you not attain and... It's not knowledge, not about knowledge. Yeah. I like that remove. That's in the course at the beginning. This course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is far beyond what can be taught. It aims at removing the obstacles yeah. to love. Yeah. And so that's the release, love suit mm -hmm. we're sharing. Yeah. Mike, do you this, does God have a name? Well, like, what about the John Vid? <laughs> There are many names that, the, that are given to or God. In, in this context, I mean, it's, it's just the... There, there is two workbook lessons that are 183 and 184 where you practice um, using the name God. Just God. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's a name. Uh, and you use it in practicing where you let go of all other names and you just practice with one name. Now, of course, we could say spirit or presence, you know, it's really, it's what is, so we could say it's nameless, because, but, but yeah, we're being practical, we're using a name. And, and it depends, when I travel around the world, in some places I go, God is, has a good feeling. You know, people are like, God, God, God. Then I go to Europe and they go, oh, we don't use that word. We don't, we don't talk about God over here, you know, in certain places. So it's, it's just, with anything, it's a symbol. A name is a symbol. But remember, the ego made up all the names, and we have to practice with what the ego made up, because it wouldn't, wouldn't be practical if we didn't allow ourselves to use words. We're, we're used to using words. And, that, and the Course encourages us to, to pray and use the symbol. The following question from that is, so for the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, Jesus, in the Course of Miracles being a reference to the Messenger. And what about Buddha and other people? Like, are they just, were they utilized in the same way? Or is, I mean, is it, does the Course of Miracles somehow acknowledge Buddha for instance? I don't know. Or other people? Well, it does say that Jesus was the first to awaken from the dream. And so if you look at it from a chronological point of view, Siddhartha and Buddha came before Jesus. So it's using Christian terminology, it's using psychological terminology, it's using educational terminology. And I would say there are many pathways. Buddhism is a beautiful pathway, and through Hinduism, Taoism, there, there are many, many amazing pathways to God. This particular one, I would say, is in Christian language uh, and educational and psychological because it's almost given as a way of correcting the ego distortions of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So you might say if there came a book like this to, to address Buddhism, it would use Buddhist terms. It's using Holy Spirit and Jesus because a lot of idols have been made out of Jesus. Uh, a lot of false idols. And and also, when you have things like sacrifice, sacrifice is a, is a key idea in tr traditional Christianity. Jesus is saying, no, the ego is the belief in sacrifice, that, that, and the ego has nothing to do with true religion. 
I think of religion as peace of mind. If somebody says, are you religious? Well, if peace of mind is your devotion, then call me whatever you want, spiritual, religious. But So in one sense, I think it came through kind of as a correction for the distortion of and that's, for that reason, it doesn't go into, you know, Krishna or Siddhartha, Buddha, and other things, because it's really not addressing those pathways. But it also says it's just one form of the universal curriculum, so it is making no criticism whatsoever of any of those, you know, deep traditions. It's just kind of helping correct the distortions of Christianity. Roberto. I just wanted to ask uh, Zbama, you know, uh, I've been wanting to ask her let's, a long time ago. Let's get that. And you mentioned <laughs> the, in the animation devotion, uh, and, uh, and she writes all these incredible lyrics, and most importantly, she shows such, such a strong devotion when she sings, which is uh, out of this world, right? So my question to you is, from where does all of that come from? <laughs> uh, oh, Roberto, I don't even know how to answer that. Um, I think, uh, <clears throat> well, I had a very deep mystical experience when I was 10 years old. And before that, I was, uh, I was not raised Christian or anything, but for some, I don't know why, but I always felt... Jesus very strongly and I prayed and I just did it myself from when I was a little girl and uh, <clears throat> and I had an uncle that uh, was living in the States and moved back to Iceland when I was four and he was in Bible school in Seattle and when he came back home he was like my he was, I just saw him like a light, a love. He, he was so present, so loving, so kind. And I started going, um, I asked my parents if I could go to church with him. It was Pentecostal church, uh, Christian. And I also had a friend who was uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And I asked my parents if I could go to these churches, and I was just going to this church and this, and um, just feeling like I just saw and felt all the love and devotion from them. And I just loved being there. And they were singing to Jesus, singing to God, and I was just, wow. I was just like basking in this love to God and love to Jesus. Um, but my parents were not taking me to church or doing anything. I just, I don't know, it was just very natural to me. And at some point I asked my parents if I could go to Bible school on Sunday. And they said, yeah, okay. And I just started going and I loved especially singing. Singing to Jesus, singing to God. Um, and when I was 10 years old, uh, I was giving a kitten. And uh, I just poured all my love to this kitten. Um, and she slept with me and woke me up in the morning. And, and I had her for around six months. And then when I was at school, she got hit by a car. Mm -hmm. And my mom took the cat to the hospital and she died in my mom's arms. And my mom left her there. And I never saw her again and I was devastated. And the next day I went to school, but I just couldn't go to school. I was not, I just sat out in the playground and cried and cried and cried all day. And when I, when the school bell rang, I went back home. And, uh, and I was always alone for some hours. Um, so I walked in, in the house and looked down to the right, to the living room, and then my grandmother was sitting on the couch with my cat, patting her, and she smiled to me, and I heard in my mind, don't worry, I will take care of your cat. And my grandmother, she died when my mom was pregnant with me, and I had the same name as her. And then I started questioning, what is death? What was happening? I saw my cat, 
and my grandmother. So I went to my room and I asked God, can I die? And then suddenly I was just out of out of the universe, out of the body, and I was just basking in this like infinite space. It was the sparkling stars I remember, and I was just like, there was no body, just the mind. And I felt so safe and so much love, and I just wanted to stay there. I was like, wow, this is, this is everything, everything. And I don't know how long this was going on, but then at some point I felt, oh wow, I was back in the body, and, but I got my answer that I'm not a body and I can never die, you know, with infinite mind. And after that, I was, I couldn't share it with anyone because I felt like it would not be understood. And I just carried it. And at some point, I, like they had talked about, I moved to Denmark and I just started getting a bit depressed because I felt like nothing, nothing made sense at all in the world. And so I went through a lot of like depression, trying to fit in the world, by all kinds of different educations and work, but I always got like my, it was like being depressed and up and down. And in Denmark, I got, I think, five different uh, labels of mental illness. And uh, it's like the system always, you know, encouraged you have to go, you have to be in the world, you have to work, you have to like, and nothing, it didn't make sense to me at all. It was, something is very, very wrong. It can't be the truth. And, um, so, but I tried and tried and tried, tried to like be normal. And, uh, and, I, and I started, I think I was around in my mid twenties, started meditating and reading and reading a lot of things. I went to India, went to Ramana Maharshi's ashram, and uh, I was praying in his cave, and uh, and he came to me, and he said, "Svava, why don't you shine?" And I was what? And then I my my um, answer to him was, "Oh, well, then I would be selfish. Like I, it was like the ego was like pushing. I can't shine because then I think I'm I'm light, you know." And um, but I went through a lot and a um, lot of, yeah, all kinds of medication and everything and tried a lot of things. And then at some point I was just down my knees and praying to God, please, just I, I, I just, I need something to pull me out of this. I just want to be happy. And uh, then of course the miracles, I was watching videos with Eckhart Tolle and Marianne Williamson was there talking about the course and something just happened. I'm like, wow, this is, this is it. This is, this is the answer. I felt it so strongly and this was about, yeah, three and a half, four years ago. And, um, and uh, I got the course in Danish and opened it up and I heard, no, you have to read this book in English. And I just, it was so strong. I, I so much trusted this. And so I closed the book and, and I got it in English. And I had so many amazing miracles, like small things happening when when I started reading the course. And it went, went so quick. Um, even I was on a lot of medication when the course came and I heard um, this, you can drop this medication, you can drop this, you have to unwind from. And I heard exactly how many weeks, how much to reduce, and I just followed it, followed it. It was like I, um, I so much trusted this because I knew if I would try it, if Svava would try to do anything, then, I would get in so much fear and so much doubt. So I trusted what I heard and I totally followed it. And within five months, 
I was totally free of medication. Uh, and it was not Svava doing anything. It was following, following Jesus' guidance. And, um, and when I was out of my medication, I went on my knees again and I said, okay, Jesus, I'll do anything for you, anything. You just show me. And uh, I think it was a few days later or even the next day, then I wasn't even searching for anything, but then this retreat with David in Holland showed up on the screen. And I felt like I had already been there. It was, this is, uh, this is it, this is, this is the next step for me. And, um, but I was in so much fear because I had never traveled on my own. I was very, very shy. I was afraid of people. I was always just in my apartment. And, uh, but it was so strong. It was so strong. You have to go, you have to go. And I signed up. And then the ego kicked in a week later and I was in so much fear, I can't go, I can't go. And, and then I tried to cancel, but I never heard from the organizer. <laughs> and then I, okay, Jesus, you really, really want me to go there. And, um, and I prayed and I prayed and I had to fly to Holland and I had to take two different trains and a bus and... and um, and I had it all, I went on Google, had it all like written down, what to do, where, what platform, everything. And then my plane was delayed and I, my whole plan was just wiped out. And I was, oh, no, you can't do this to me. And I was just in so much fear on the plane. And I was praying and praying and praying. And a total miracle happened when the plane landed. All this fear just flipped around. And I was so excited. It was like, like I got so much energy, so much joy. And, and I started talking to people on the plane. Um, I'm going to this place, do you know how to do? And I, I never talked to strangers. So I was like, what is going on with me? And this man there, he said, oh, my parents live there. And all these people came to me, helped me buy tickets and guided me and it was just like I was carried through all the way and uh, remember coming out of the bus the last last uh, place there where we were yeah where the retreat was and um, and I stepped out of the bus it was totally dark and I said okay Jesus what am I gonna do now and then he said turn around and knock on the door in the house, at the house behind you. And I turned around, there was light in the house, and I walked down, knocked on the door, and there was this elderly couple that opened the door, and they didn't speak any English at all, but I had the address, and they were so kind. The man drew a map for me, and they were just like so loving and kind, and he took my bag, and he carried it half the way to show me and I came into this cafeteria and there were people there and normally I would never say anything, I would just hide in the back, but I just came in and I said, is this a retreat with David Hoffmeister? Like, and they all looked at me like, yeah, welcome, do you want coffee? And so I was just like, wow, what is going on? Wow, what is going on? And uh, it was like, it was like all these uh, hiding and judgments and unworthiness in my that I had believed in just like puff, disappeared, and uh, and I got this weak, so clear guidance what to do, what to say, and I heard like from the beginning you have to talk to David, and I said Jesus, no way, I'm not gonna talk to David. I'm just gonna sit in the back. Okay. and do this retreat, and then I'm going to go back home. And, uh, but it just kept on coming, you know, no way, no way. And then I said to Jesus, okay, if I'm to do that, you have to make it very obvious. And uh, it was an evening, we uh, were going to have a movie, and I was sitting there, 
and then I saw David walk in and go to the next room and then I heard now I have arranged it for you now you go and talk to David and I was so afraid so I said no way I'm not going to do it and I was holding my hands to the chair and then suddenly my legs just started walking I was not in control of the body <laughs> and then I suddenly was standing in front of David I was terrified and I was just I just I remember my words were like shaking. Could I have a one-on-one with you? And he was just so kind. Yeah, of course it would be wonderful. And and uh, yeah, and we had a one-on-one. And Jesus told me what to ask and what to say. And it was like, oh my God, what is happening to my life? And. Uh, Yeah, and then I went back to Denmark and I I could feel that the calling, it was so, so, so strong that it was my time to be used. Jesus had a plan for me. And uh, like I told the other day about the, the photo uh, with the wax and and everything got like so quickly just wrapped up. It was like I just heard prompts and I, I just followed and followed and followed and suddenly I was in the community and I had no idea what a community was. <laughs> I had absolutely no idea what I was going into but it was like there was no other way. It was just this way. Um, yeah. And then starting been guiding to do the music. I always loved music. I sang in a children's choir when I was a child, and, but I was—I've never learned like to sing or do anything. But it just started coming to me in dreams or in meditations or on a walk. I hear—I just hear the melody, sometimes the melody and lyrics at the same time, sometimes just lyrics, and then I just feel wait, 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 and then now it's time for this song and then yeah it's just the uh, it's really the, the more I can just take Svava out of the way the more pure and uh, yeah the more I can be used and and that is my joy to being used for Jesus and to spread the love and just just be And it's so easy to just be. It's just so natural. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. <It> was <laughs> yeah, the other thing I think that's been helpful too, that Sava has always told me, is that Jesus appears to Sava. Jesus actually appears to her, so when she's had some of her most terrifying times, um, he will just appear right in front of her and, and look her right in the eye and talk to her. And one of them was at that retreat because we had, uh, there was about 57 people there for, was it five days? Yeah. And um, at one point, um, I guess it was maybe after we'd had our one-on-one, -on -one, she was feeling all this love, uh, and she she had the thought, just say, I love you to David, and she's like, ah, oh. you know, just, oh, I just had a one-on-one, -on -one. she didn't even want to have a one-on-one -on -one with me, so you can imagine those three words, saying those words, and so she was in her room, and, and uh, she was asking me to come over, but uh, she had tremendous fear tremendous fear come up around that, of, of just sitting in front of me and saying that to me. And so she was in her room and there was like these two beds and so she sat there like praying and praying like, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know if I can do this and maybe you can share the story because Jesus then sat right across from you, on the bed right across from you and and coached you through her fears, because her fear was, oh my God, what if there's a rejection? You know, you kind of just imagine for yourself any kind of fears that would come up. What if it's a rejection? What if, what if he doesn't acknowledge it or accept it or, you know, this and this, and basically Jesus is saying, 
you still have me, you know. Imagine Jesus is looking right into your eyes and like, here's your greatest fears and you still have me and I'll be with you always, you know, before that kind of encounter. But that was very, very powerful because it's not like it's once, you know, Jesus has appeared many times. And that's also very, again, it's like a symbol. It's just a symbol because Jesus is with us all and it's very, very present. But these symbols are just showing how, how gracious the Spirit is, you know, to give you what you need when you have the fear because there's important steps to take. Whether they're illusions or not, there are steps to take. And we have to take them in love. We have to take them in faith. And you can just share how, I mean, that was very powerful for you, I know, every time. Yeah, I um, I couldn't sleep after the one-on-one -on -one all night, and I just felt like, yeah, like my heart has just like exploded, like I had so much love coming through, and, um, and I, <clears throat> and Jesus told me I had to tell David, that I had so much love for him. And I was so scared. I was like, I can't do that. What if he laughs at me and like old, and yeah, old beliefs of rejection and being unwanted. And, and then in the morning, I remember I, I wrote you a message that I had something important that I needed to say. But just before I leave and I was hoping that I could just quickly say it and then just take the plane. <laughs> but then, uh, <clears throat> and then you wrote, wrote that you could come over. But before that, um, I uh, I was sitting on the bed and I was just praying and just, oh Jesus, what am I, what am I going to do? What if He doesn't acknowledge it? Or yeah, what if I just feel that I'm wrong? And um, and then Jesus appeared to me on the bed. It was like um, two beds. I was yeah. I signed up to have a roommate, but roommate never came. So it was very orchestrated. And uh, and then Jesus appeared to me on the other bed, and he said to me, "Slava, whatever happens, I am always with you." And then. I felt like, oh wow, yeah, I'm never alone. I can, I had the strength to say it. And then David came to the room and of course sat the same place Jesus had been sitting. And then it just came out of my mouth, I'm in love with you. And you were just so kind and said, I love you too. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it was huge. It totally changed my life. Yeah, it's never been the same. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta, for asking. <laughs> if you wanted to ask this question before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it, it really is a listen and follow, you know, really trust, really listen, really follow, and then trust that, that the help will show up if you have fears, or that you can just pray, like Bob was saying on the airplane, you know, because the plane was late, that all her plans taken away, but, but she prayed and then she came through the fear and then all the miracles happened, people guiding her, and that's the way it works for all of us. The ego wants to throw the fear up to stop us from following, to stop us from moving forward, to stop, stop our minds from expanding. It will throw up all kinds of resistances and all kinds of justifications and reasons just based on past feelings of unworthiness, past memories of hurt, past memories of rejection. That's why we hesitate to follow, because there's something from the past rising up and saying, don't even think of it, don't even consider that. 
There's one part in Course of Miracles where Jesus says, it's not that you ask for too much. You ask for far too little. It's like going to spirit with a little, you know, like those sewing thimbles that you put over your fingers and going up with a little teeny little thimble going, could I perhaps have a little love? And Jesus is like, ask for the ocean, ask for everything. Don't limit your prayers, don't limit your asking. You are so worthy of everything, you are worthy of of all the love that there is in the universe. You are love, you are love itself. But it's very helpful to think about that in terms of prayer, that if we limit our asking, it's only because of the unworthiness that we feel. That we don't feel worthy to ask for, for that love. But once you start to relax and, and ask and receive, then that starts to show you the how it works, and it also shows you the power of the mind. That we think that it's a lot to, uh, you know, if you had the, the faith of the the size of the grain of a mustard seed, a tiny little seed. Jesus, the Bible says you could move mountains. Then, when you get into the course, you realize the mountains are tiny compared to this cosmos, and that that our mind is moving the planets and moving the spheres and moving the galaxies and the scientists still are discovering more galaxies and the idea of moving mountains seemed like a huge thing and Jesus is like, oh no, you actually have, have a very, very powerful mind. We share the same mind, but as long as you give that powerful mind over to the ego, then you feel small, you feel tiny. You feel like you're just a tiny little speck in a in a vast universe. It's not the truth, and you do have to follow the guidance step by step. But the instructions are given, and we all can can feel that. You know, I think that's what we really wanted to convey in this weekend. It's just it's highly individualized. You have a, an amazing intu intuition. You have an amazing connection. Feel free to use it, and then feel free to open up your asking, uh, so that you can ask for you can ask for states of mind. You can ask to be shown. You can ask to be uh, one of my favorite prayers over the years has always been make it obvious. And when I have this very strong prayer to make it obvious, I have the most for me amazing signs and symbols where doors close when I'm not meant to go through certain doors, doors open in unexpected ways, in places that I could never have even imagined there even was an opening. And we can't foresee all the things, but we can trust and just ask to be shown. And, and please make it obvious. So I would, I would suggest that's a very good uh, prayer. <laughs> make it obvious whenever you get to, to a point. Well, David, you know, uh, we, are, we are here together, and, and I'd like you said, it, it's strongly individualized, it's experience, right? but uh, from, uh, you know, from you guys, you know, Jeffrey, Francis, and Fava, and Jeffrey, and, and uh, from uh, Louise, and Fernanda, and I think they're organized, and everything else is For me, Kids are going to make a lot. And I remember the day that I got the book, like 70 years ago, and I said, well, God, this is not from, from here. And I, I'm still with the book, but you made, you made it very clear for me for this weekend, so I don't have no questions anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any questions. And this seminar didn't come from this word. This, this, what you guys have brought, came from, from, from someplace else. So I have to ask to thank you very much for that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we speak for all of us. You know, we, were, we were just also touched and, yeah, this was divinely orchestrated every step of the way. So, And that's a perfect way to wrap up, I think, because it's just a note of gratitude that we all 
feel like we couldn't have have orchestrated this and I, I felt it's been beautiful to hear from some of you of, of even the steps that you took to get here and how miraculous that has been uh, yeah I did that one on one with Patricia and it was amazing that you ended up here and and for all of us you know in the ark <laughs> we all ended up in the ark somehow <laughs> We could feel all the animals with us, we could feel the whole universe with us, and uh, yeah, we're just so touched that we could come here and share this with you, and and actually, it was a few years ago, I think, um, Jeffrey was here too, and you had your wife, Susanna, with you, and we, we did a, a gathering at that same uh, center where we, we were on Wednesday night, we were downstairs last time, right. But uh, Roberto had said, I want to do uh, fill the place. And we had about 70 people there a few years ago. And we did live streaming, I believe, around Brazil and the world, and the world Port Portugal and, and so forth. And after that, we started doing much more online uh, things. It just, the technology was there. It was helpful. We still travel a lot. But, but we are feeling to do more and more online uh, events and so we just wanted to share that, that if we, I just feel like we will be doing more that way for myself I told Luis uh, I said I said I, I don't know that I'll be traveling as much because it's been yeah I have been traveling very extensively over the last 30 years it has involved living out of a suitcase for 30 basically most of 30 years and uh, I'm, I'm down to a small little, uh, Louis lent me a little zipper bag thing that I think Jeffrey's already loaded into the car, but, but I feel intuitively it's going to be more, more digital things because um, we have done a number of those and they've gone very, they're very intimate and people cry and they emote and everything that we experienced here, we watch movies together, on the internet and they're very profound and we do feel like there can be people in different countries like local organizers where we could we can do it in a in a place like we just did on Wednesday if there's a screen uh, and, and we can project up on there we can join in it takes some coordination with translation sometimes we've done this whole retreat in English but it feels very strong that we're going to be doing a lot more of that uh, this year and that we're, we're coming into some new technologies and starting to get more relaxed with the technologies and everything. So that's really our prayer, that we would love to stay in contact. And if you feel a strong calling to participate and be in that, uh, Paula's going to come over to uh, Mexico and help us join in ideas. We're just at the idea phase of sharing a lot of this. Fernandez talked about online courses. So really, you have a passion about that right now. And so we're really open. We're kind of in the idea stage of how we can collaborate and join online and still keep that nurturing and connection going that we, we all experience. And so if anybody wants to participate in that, just... Next one is next weekend. Next weekend, yeah. Next weekend. The Forgiven World, we have an online World. retreat called The Forgiven World, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And Sunday. Uh, all their emails, so we'll send out an email with the links so you guys can all get okay. direct access to where you sign up and those things. And I have a few cards for our own physical event in Utah this year, so... Some of them saw the movie after saw the monastery. I saw some eyes lighting up last night when, when the question came in about the happy dreams, you know, and, and that's basically what this whole uh, weekend retreat coming up, the 6th and 7th or 8th, I think, of December, it's on the Forgiven World, it's on the happy dream. So the whole theme that I'll be sharing and Francis will be sharing at so I'll, uh, I will be flying to Iceland. You'll be flying to Iceland on that one. But we have others. So we have a theme um, every month. It's the first full weekend, the first full Friday, Saturday, Sunday of every month. We do an online retreat. And also, the guides have been coming in. Uh, some of you were able to see the movie Take Me Home, but we're getting guidance to show. We'll sh 
There'll be a three-day weekend, the 27th, 28th, 29th of December, and then as we move into 2020, the feeling is maybe you can just share the, of doing those weekend movie gatherings with the movie that came through you and, and doing it with the subtitles and with translation. So you were just sharing, we were having a talk over in the kitchen this morning about uh, having a Portuguese online three-day uh, retreat with the movie in the middle and the setup and all the Q&A and everything of the Portuguese translation. Yeah, we have a sh we have shown the movie. I think the first the premiere of the movie was done in August in Utah. That was the first time, and ever since August till now, it's only three months. But we have shown uh, quite a few times. Um, but every time we show we sh we have shown the movie in the context of a retreat. We have never shown the movie without a full retreat context because just the fact that the movie can point to so many themes and can drive the mind so much deeper with different things. And um, yeah, I just feel like that's the best way to actually uh, show the movie. And, and um, so we are gonna show the fir first online one um, after Christmas this time. The next year, we're just open to show it in all languages, but all throughout this kind of weekend sessions where you know, we have a Friday night, probably, and then a Saturday we get into something, then show the movie, and then Sunday follow up, because there's some, yeah, just so many. And every, every weekend, I, we notice that it's a little different focus. The topic that we really zoom into is a little different, depending on the guidance and the word of, the, the, I think the audience had called for. So that's the that's the plan for now. Yeah, we, we don't have a plan for the date. It's right, one in August in Utah, then one in October in Holland, right? Yeah, we, we have uh, three physical retreats planned for 2020. January in Mexico, yeah. August in Utah, and October in Holland. And we have no other physical retreat planned right now. Um, so just like David shared, everything else probably we're just gonna go more into digital for the next year. But no, no specific dates apart from those monthly online retreats yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Francis was feeling. I mean, Jeffrey and his wife Susanna had started looking into where the strong call is for the movie, and a lot of it is in the eastern part of the United States, and uh, also the west and the south. And so that was felt possibly to be around the springtime, uh, May, March, April, May, but also we're so open to the online, so it could be a combination of online and a physical retreat or or online, and then we are so open. That's why we're just in a phase of, of talking, sharing ideas. Uh, I know there was a time years ago when Francis and I were in China, and when we were over there in China, Byron Katie was doing a remote uh, gathering where she was beamed in to a, a hall with a, with a translator and a lot of people, and she just simply beamed in and engaged in a very direct way with everybody. So those kind of things, too, if, if people feel to host something, like host an online retreat, it could be in Europe, it could be in down in Brazil, it could be anywhere, and we join together and we, we have translations and we are able to go have the same kind of experience. But for me, the, the, the travel, I've done so much extensive travel, so... Until the teleporting comes in, <laughs> it might be a break a little bit from that. <laughs> no, beautiful. That's, that's how we all feel. Yeah. Filled up. <laughs> Let's take a picture, everybody together. Photo. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> If I'd like to ask you the last question. Oh, wait a minute. The so, last, the last question. The last question. We, always, we always have the last question. Uh -huh. so, so, at the same time, we have the script written. We can create our reality. 
Well, not that's one of the new age things of creating your own reality, but that still gets into manifesting. And as I said, there, there's a there's a level of awareness that's beyond manifesting. Not that manifesting is wrong, because it has a purpose to show you how powerful your mind is, which is helpful because you that undoes the belief of being a victim. But there is something uh, beyond that. I, I had a gathering one time where I was in Michigan and uh, I did this gathering and this woman came up to me and she was so sweet, she said, David, I'm a manifester and I can manifest anything. And I, I do, I manifest houses, cars, boats, soulmates. I manifest everything, not just for myself, but for my friends and everything like this. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, well, the next time, after we finish our break and have our snacks, I'm going to have you talk and share all of your miracles of manif manifesting with everybody in the group. And she did. And then I told her also, and I'll, I'll kind of hint at, at the, what's beyond that step in your mind. Because that's not the final step. Because ultimately we can't create our own reality because God created, God is the creator of reality. Mm -hmm. So the most we can do is forgive whatever is not of God. And it's more like the release that you talked about, like Lao Tzu. A release, to come to wisdom, it's release and release and release. It's sometimes ego would have us believe it's manifest, manifest, manifest. But it never know. But ultimately manifesting, if you take it really take a look at it, it's like there still is a belief when you want to manifest something that you know what's best for you. <laughs> and that knowing of what's best for you still comes from the past. Yeah. And the past is where the guilt is. Yeah. So so there's still going to be some guilt associated with the manifesting because it always is trying to make a change in the form for something that's believed to be better. But the mind that's asleep and dreaming that has lost track of what's better and worse. You know, it needs help. And in the end, God is spirit and God is the creator of reality. So we can't really create our own reality. We can accept the reality that was created for us, which is spirit, light. That's, that's ultimately why it's just a step because we, we need to honor the true author of reality, which has nothing to do with human beings. Mm -hmm. Human beings mm -hmm. are not really good at, at authoring reality because, because God is the author of reality and we can humbly accept ourselves as God created us instead of trying to make ourselves different mm -hmm. than God created mm -hmm. us. So that's, it's a good step, you know, it's something you can, you can celebrate but it's something that you, you know will eventually give way. Once you start to realize the power of the mind, then, then you start to ask the question, what is it for? What, why do I have a powerful mind? And it's for peace eternal, you know, to come to, to know our natural state. So it's a good one. That's a good one. It, you know, you probably deal with, at, at the center, mm -hmm. a lot of aspects mm -hmm. of that... Uh, that idea, and, and that's the way many centers deal with many aspects of create your own reality. That's kind of a, they call it, it's kind of a new age mm -hmm. idea, and mm -hmm. then ultimately this is, this is like the end. Uh, sometimes people come to the course and they, we were talking about that at the breakfast today, where they get the course and they go, mm, looks like this is closer to the end of the road. <laughs> and it's a deep feeling, like uh, many of us have, have I know in Brazil, it's, it's quite famous. Uh, Brazil is known for the open-mindedness, mm -hmm. the many pathways, and so on and so forth. I feel like that's very much where my heart was. And then when I started to come into this, I started feeling like a, like a huge calling where um, Jesus was like saying, very good, very good, David. You have traveled the path of leave no stone unturned. And he said, now I'm going to say, pick your path and take it all the way into demonstration. You know, now instead of the variety of the paths, be the living one. 
come into full embrace of the one that you are. And, and that's another uh, important step on the journey. I was very grateful for the open-mindedness of checking out. I didn't, re didn't regret any of the searching, and I didn't regret any of the exploring, but, but it was like Jesus was saying, you've been really at this seeker, you've been a seeker for many, many years. Would you like to be a finder? <laughs> I'm like, I like the sound of that, whatever that is. So that's that's it. That's the context. I well, there was, it is. I Thank you. <laughs> um, the dream begins when the baby is inside the mother's belly, or he or he is somewhere in between the dream and I don't know something else. Like, what is the, that little baby being, uh, I don't know, the body being produced and elaborated? Like, w what is that ego or the, of that mind? Because, like, I feel sometimes babies are born with all those diseases and everything. And, I mean, what is that up? You know, he yeah. just got here. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the birth is not a beginning and death isn't an ending and and the dream goes way, way beyond what we would consider of the birth of a child or the death of a human being. So you might say that um, there's one point in the Course where Jesus says all your time is spent in dreaming. Nighttime dreams, daydreams, and We, when we look at the world from the human perspective, the, it can be a curiosity, like when, when starts, when does something start, and this and this. But from a quantum perspective, I like to kind of use a contrast experience. Like we can think, okay, there's a soul, and the soul comes in and incarnates and starts off as a baby. And Jesus said, well, It's not quite like that. It's more like if you imagine your soul and you have a little back, soul backpack and you reach back into your soul backpack and you throw out the whole cosmos <laughs> from your backpack. Your mind is generating the entire cosmos. It's not like a soul incarnating. It's more like The, all of time and space comes out from your mind. And so, you may think of it more as just like changing a channel like on a remote. Like, all it really is is a, a little click to a change to a different seeming frequency of what we would consider a lifetime. It's just another learning opportunity. Uh, and it really doesn't have anything to do with beginning or ending with time. It's very, very deep and pervasive. That's why babies can be born with birth defects and everything. And sometimes people say, well, their brain isn't even developed and it's just a brand new soul. And why would a brand new soul start off with spina bifida or with some kind of birth defect? You know, well, the dream and that unconscious guilt that we talked about, the do you dream in secret is is way, way beyond any context of, of birth and death, yeah. And the dream in secret and the, the exposing mind is the wrong mind. Both are wrong yeah, mind, Yeah, right? both are wrong mind, yeah. And both, they, they're in duality, like positive and negative, and love is the own, right? Yep, and wrong mind is... The dream you dream in secret is part of duality, and the dream you gave away is part of That's duality, right. and then the right mind, or the happy dream, is where the duality ends. It's like the quantum field. Everything is connected. So you can't say this or that. It's all connected. It's all unified. And that's the goal. The goal really isn't love. The goal is a unified field. The goal is forgiveness. So it's, it's good to keep that in mind. We use the love word a lot, but, but love has many meanings in this world. Romantic love, I love my kitten. I love my puppy dog, I love my Volvo, <laughs> I love, you know, it's, you see the bumper stickers, I heart, you know, it's got many things on there, but, but really love is, is not like our goal, that's just what is. We're working on more the, the releasing and emptying out everything else that seems to be in the way of the love. Have you read uh, The Personal Life? 
I don't know, with books, I tell you, I don't read. Uh, people sometimes say, have you read this? A spirit is not an avid reader. Uh, so I think I've forgotten. <laughs> I'm starting to for, I'm, I'm having a reverse amnesia. I'm, for, I'm starting to forget what happened in this world. And what about cursing love? Do you believe that it's a continuum of the cursing love? No. Right? No. It's not the same metaphysics. No. Sorry, what was the question? There's a, there's a book called The Course of Love, and she was saying, is it an extension of A Course in Miracles? I said, no, it's actually, it's not, it's different metaphysics, but it... Oh, but you there, said it yesterday, actually. Hmm? Yeah. You mentioned it already, there's some different metaphysics yeah. on the course. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, I would say... That was, that was triggered, like, what do you mean? It's a beautiful pathway. I think it, it's very, very kind of soft and poetic, and I actually feel that for many people, people will work their way into the course. It's more of a precursor of the course, but there's there's not really any updates or extensions or anything that comes after the course. Even the course itself says this course has everything that you need. So why would you have a follow-up to a book that says that says everything you need? In fact, the course says this course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love. So why would the next book be a course of love when it's like saying jump off the books? jump into the experience, you know, and it's very, very deep. Also, there's lots of Jesus channel channelers and many, many channelers and everything, but yeah, I've, those all, I've been through a lot of them and they've, they've been very helpful. They all served. There are many things that serve. So I feel like we are not meant to judge against anything, but we're also not meant to try to piggyback and attach our writings onto something as if it's a continuation of something when the only continuation of the course would be to to uh, disappear into divine love. That's mm -hmm. a that's a continuation if you if you want a continuation. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. Amen.